I'm actually going to introduce John Vickers to you, and John is a 30-year veteran of real estate uh, sales and marketing in the Bay Area, and he has done business with both of uh, the gentlemen who are speaking today, and can give you a little bit of background and information on why it's important to listen to what they have to say and how effective their programs are. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce John. Okay, Adam, Patrick, everybody. So, the, uh, first of all, thank you for coming to our workshop on tax deferred exchanges while well, actually selling real estate in a tax efficient way. Tax deferred exit strategies, I think it's a better way to put it. And uh, we are really excited to have two of the long standing pros that have been working in helping their clients with tax deferral for long, long time to uh, give us a talk about that. So our, for our workshop today, we'll start off with, we'll have uh, just a brief introduction from me and then we'll have about 20 minutes each for them to talk about what they do. And what's interesting is that each one of these guys, Ralph Bunchy and Stan Crow, they each use a different part of the section code to enable sellers for tax deferral. Ralph Bungie uses Section 1031, which you probably recall is tax deferred exchanges and uh, reverse exchanges and property swaps. Stanley Crow uses Section 453 for installment sale reporting, and more specifically, monetized installment sales that allow you to defer your tax and get cash out to invest in other things. But before we get started on that, uh, let me give you a little background on why we suggested to do this workshop. So as, as Patrick alluded, I'm a commercial realist just like you. I'm an agent broker. I've been doing this for a while. My product class is multifamily and uh, we're in retail under 25,000 feet. And as I traveled around the, the Bay Area, not just San Francisco, of course it's the bellwether here, but uh, there's, a, there's a question that's answered almost repeatedly. And the question is, why isn't there so much inventory to sell? Why aren't there that many buildings for sale? And actually, there are. There are the, if you look at historically, there are the same number of buildings for sale. It just feels like there's no buildings for sale. And the, the real question I think you need to ask is why aren't sellers putting their property on the market in a market in which there are signals, there are signs that we are kind of in a peaking point. There are all sorts of indicators out there. I just pick one. I was drive, we're driving into San Francisco today and I noticed I counted nine cranes going up here in San Francisco. A friend of mine told me there are 3,300 new units that are coming out just in San Francisco alone that are under construction or permit. Berkeley, there's 2,100. Oakland, I think there's 14,000. That's a lot of competition. 14,000 new units coming in. A lot of competition. Interest rates. Well, interest rates are so low, the Federal Reserve can't do anything with the money supply. They have no room to budge. They've got to raise the interest rates, and that'll be the cost of capital. Another reason why this market seems to be, you know, nudging up at the top is the surplus of buyers and capital. Well, I know everybody in this room probably has at least five or 10 people they could call with a good property, right? If you don't, you better get on the phone. But, uh, and capital comes from all <coughs> over the world. It comes from not only from, you know, from the, from, uh, the Bay Area here, but uh, internationally, Asia, <coughs> Europe, all over. And that has the, the tendency to push prices up. And then, thanks to all of you, we have a very efficient marketplace. Things move very quickly. The MLS, what you do, moves everything very quickly, <coughs> so prices do have a tendency to rise pretty quickly. There are all sorts of exogenous fa factors, too, that, uh, that indicate we're kind of pushing a, a real high watermark on our prices here. Uh, just Europe, the, the European markets are flat and not doing so well. The Middle East, where all the oil is, 
is uh, essentially, it's the most fragile it's ever been. The, even in our, uh, even here in the United States, the national debt is as high as it's been, it's higher than it has been ever. Then even our own little world here in selling property, Congress is now giving signals they want to curtail 1031 exchanges. Well, all of those things have the effect of pushing property prices up. Yet, there's not that many property on the market. Why don't more sellers put properties on the market? And one of the big factors that people take into consideration when they're selling a property is taxes, capital gains taxes. And California is not bashful about taxation. 9.3% is the rate for California taxes, just California. That's the highest in the nation. Then you add on the federal tax at 20%, you add on the health care tax at 3.8%, you've got a 1% tax above a million dollars. I think that's for California health care. Then if you're if it's investment property, you've got depreciation recapture. You see how dizzy you're getting? And then when you get into those higher levels of, of, of income, you start to lose your exemptions and deductions. So by the time you sell your property, you'll be at least 35%, maybe even 40% of every dollar of profit, capital gain, goes out in taxes. It's a big consideration. So what do you do when the seller starts to complain? You're talking to sellers about their properties. What do you do when they say, look, I don't know. That's a lot of sweat equity to give away just because we're passing a deed to somebody. What do you do? Well, that's why we invited our two guest speakers today to talk to us about ways in which folks have tax, can do tax deferral. And in some cases, uh, avoid it. So the <clears throat> so with that, I think I'm going to introduce our speakers. And we've decided with our kind of our coin toss, we've got Ralph Bungie. I'll introduce Ralph first. Ralph Bungie is the CEO and founder of Independent Exchange Services back uh, since 1980. He has, uh, he also has the founder of Reverse Exchange Services. Ralph is a CPA by training. He's got an MS, he's got a, well, let's see, a master's in taxation, an MS in accounting. Uh, he has, he is the past president and current director for the Federation of Exchange Accommodators. That's the National Association for Exchange Accommodators. He has, over his tenure, has had done a myriad of transactions for his clients. Everything, not only tax for exchanges, but also uh, mergers and acquisitions, bankruptcy, reorganizations, financing, uh, joint ventures, and, and troubled assets. Now, uh, just as an aside, this is sort of an anecdote about, it's not in his bio, but Ralph was uh, asked to be an expert witness by the FBI in a big case involving exchange accommodators, uh, Southwest, it's uh, in the industry, it's, it's, a, it's the one that everybody remembers. And this is where Southwest, as an exchange accommodator, took all the exchange money and then gambled it away and left the exchange ores, the, the sellers, with no money to go out and buy their uplays and a huge tax bill. So, uh, and Ralph was the guy that, that the FBI called in to give, bring them up to speed on tax for exchanges. So with that, he can bring us up to speed. So let's invite Ralph up for a talk about tempo exchanges. Good. Thank you. <laughs> wow, the room expanded. It's amazing how many people are here. How many of you have done a 1031 exchange recently? How many experts do we have here in the room? How many have worked with me before? I know I've got a client here, one over there. <clears throat> okay, well, let me introduce uh, our, our little company to you. As he said, we've been around since 1980. We kind of invented 
uh, the delayed exchange way back at the time of the Starker case. And when the Starker case became case law, in December of 79, we started independent exchange services to act as a qualified intermediary. So we're really somebody who stands in the middle of a transaction where the buyer and the seller, are, are the, the buyer wants to buy from the seller, the seller wants to sell the buyer, but the seller doesn't want to pay tax. And so we step in the middle of the transaction and that allows us to take the, the seller's cash, park it until the seller can find another property and then we use that to buy that property and complete the exchange. And what I'm concerned about in today's market, some of what you're talking about, is that we have a lot of strange situations. And San Francisco has a lot of strange situations. How many of you are residential landlords here? Okay, notice all these people. These are all members of the National Masochist Society. <laughs> <laughs> you always have to be sure and let your clients know that. You know, if you're going to qualify to be a residential landlord, you have to join the Masochist Society. This experience is self so similar. I mean, your two best days are the day you buy it and the day you sell it. But in between, it's quite an experience. Quite a ride, sir. Now, what I've done is I put together a little series of uh, information for you that you can you know, put in your desk. And it's going to give you some brief summaries of some of the areas of the Federal Revenue Code that are important to you when you're trying to uh, remember how to do an exchange. But I want to call your attention to this one little list in the back because this is important. If you understand these four factors, you'll have the basic idea of how an exchange works and it will work to your advantage if you can explain it intelligently to your clients. And if you can't, call me and I'll explain it to your clients. It's not a problem. We're a very consultative practice and we're always happy to, and well, some of our clients know this, that, that we go through an awful lot of work to start, try to figure out the transaction for a client and suggest strategies that will get them through their transaction or to give them some ideas for doing something they didn't think was possible. And we're always happy to help you guys. We're here to help you guys get deals done. But take a look at these four factors. The first one, the like-kind requirement. Like-kind is really simple. Investment property, sold, investment property, purchase. It makes no difference what kind of property it is. It could be land, it could be a farm, it could be a ranch. It could be your trade or business property. So if you wanted to open your own brokerage office and you wanted to own the building, you could trade out of your apartment house into your office building. Not a problem. So a lot of, le a lot of flexibility in doing 1031 exchanges for a like time. Now a lot of people say, well, what about, you know, what if, if I'm going to move into it? Well, hang on. If you move into it, that's personal use property. So you have to be careful that you don't try to confuse a personal residence with an investment property. Now there's some things I'm going to bring to your attention today that I think are important for you to realize there are some integration plays between section 121. You all know what that is? It's a number of $250,000 ring the bell for you. That's the exemption every individual gets who owns a property that they live in if they've lived in it two out of the last five years. So there is a way of integrating 1031 and that. And I'm going to go over that with you briefly. Now, number one, the number two thing is the financial structure rule. A lot of people get confused as to what they have to reinvest. And you know that if you sell for a gross sales price, you take out your commissions and, and closing costs, you have a net sales price. That is a key factor to utilize in your plan. First of all, it's how they derive their capital gain. And secondly, it's the target purchase price for what you want to buy. So the key is you have to be equal or up in the net sales price of what you sell in terms of what you buy. It could be two properties or three properties that add up to that number, but at least it has to be that number if you wish to pay no tax. If you trade down, you only pay tax on the difference. The other aspect of that thing is the equity. So when you pay off the mortgage principal, you have, you have left is equity. We call that the exchange credit. And that has to go through the exchange process and it goes in as down payment on what you wish to buy. And so long as you get equal or up that number and this number, you'll have a successful exchange so long as you get the timing right. Now, just for the record, if you didn't want to have any debt on a property and you wanted to add cash out of pocket and put it in to pay down the debt, you can do that. So it's not so much about not taking on the same amount of debt, it's about adding more equity to make up the difference. Now, if you suddenly trade down, say, by 10000 and you take out 10000 of cash, you're only taxed on the 10000 
If you take out 20,000 and trade down by 10, you pay tax on 20. If you trade up and take out 10, you're taxed on 10 even though you traded up. So the financial structure rule is just important to recognize the interplay between the net sales price, the equity, and the mortgage. Any questions on that? It, uh, that's an accounting concept, but it works. Okay. Now the one that drives everybody nuts is the 45-day identification rule. Uh, some of you here are over 40, and if you are over 40, you realize that time passes faster for people over 40. <laughs> so uh, it's key that your clients who are over 40 realize that so that they don't blow the 45-day rule because it can be going like that. And that gets us into the kind of market that we have today where everything is insane. You go out to buy a property and four other people show up. Or you're overbidding by $200,000 to buy some property that's really worth, you know, a million, but it's selling for two. I mean, it's just insane, some of the transactions we're seeing going down today. So you want to be sure that you're in control. And that leaves me with the what I call a philosophical statement that works for your life and for exchanges particularly. Always know where you're going before you leave where you've been. Always know where you're going before you leave where you've been. Because if you have a plan and you execute against a plan, the chances are you'll be successful. But if you don't execute a plan or you're uh, we get people that call up, oh, we're closing tomorrow, we just heard about exchanges. That's not a good position to be in. A 45-day rule will really give you a hard time. Now, the 180-day rule has to do with when you close escrow on your replacement property. So all of that starts on the day you close escrow on your relinquished property. If today was the closing, tomorrow is day one, two, three, on out to 180, within which there's 45. On your identification, all you have to do to identify and meet the IRS requirement is that you identify, you can identify up to three properties. You can buy one, two, or all three. You don't have to be in contract on them to identify them. But it helps because you have control. And the biggest problem of the 45-day rule is you could lose control. Now, if you get into contract on one and you've got two backups, that's great. That's even better. There is also a 200% rule that says, well, if you listed more than three properties, so long as you take the gross sales price of what you sell, multiply it by two, and all the gross purchase prices of the ones you list stay under that number, you can list more than three properties. But the chances are you're buying something of an equivalent value to what you sold, in which case with three properties, you're already over that limit. So we only see that about four or 5% of the time. Virtually everything is a three property rule. Now, anything you buy beforehand, you could buy 20 properties beforehand, you know, or get them all done within the 45-day rule, then you can buy all of them, not a problem. So the key for the 45-day rule is to recognize that it applies to those properties you buy between the 45th and 180th day. Anything bought in between, you know, you're going to be, you know, if you've done on it, you've done identified it. You don't even have to come up with a, with a written identification. But the 45-day rule requires a written identification, typically to us, but it could also be in the form of written contract with the seller. So either way, written identification solves the problem. And when we get one of those and we sign off on it, you put it in your file. If you're ever audited, you can prove that you're identified on time. And let me tell you that right now, the Franchise Tax Board is being extremely aggressive in the exchange area. Why do you suppose that is? The state is broke. I mean, we all know the state is having financial problems. Or we should all know because it's pretty obvious. But they're, they're, they've taken an aggressive stand on exchanges. So we want to be sure that whatever you do, you do it conservatively. And with the idea of keeping it so simple, even an FTB agent can understand it. <laughs> or an IRS agent if that's the case. But the IRS hasn't been as aggressive as the FTB. It's a peculiarity for us here in California. Now, the fourth deal you need to remember is the documentation and procedures deal. And that's what we do. We provide you with the documentation, the procedures, and a consultative relationship between you and your client to help them figure out strategies to solve problems. And that's what we're good at, and that's what we've been doing for 35 years of exchanges. Now, those are the basic rules. If you have a concept there, you just grasp that thing, you're 85% of the way to having an understanding of 1031 and how it works in your client. 
Now let's think about ways we can utilize 1031 effectively in a San Francisco market environment. First of all, know that if you have a client who has an investment property and they want to buy a personal residence, and you can get them a duplex or a triplex, we can 1031 exchange into part of the property, they can buy the rest as a personal residence. So we've seen a lot of people utilize an investment property to position themselves to buy a personal residence in San Francisco. That's a really sound strategy. Conversely, when you go to sell it, part of the transaction is a 1031, part of it's a personal residence. And if you get the personal residence rule going for you, up to 250,000 per person who lives and owns the property. Makes no difference whether you're a gay couple or a married couple, or just a couple of people renting a place together, or owning a place together. You both are entitled to that exemption. Okay, so 500,000 seems like a lot. I remember when it was real money. <laughs> and, and now, we don't know what it is, but it's <laughs> with, these, with these gains going on. So that leaves you, if you're selling personal residences for clients, and you talk to your client about selling their personal residence, they say, well, I'd love to do it, uh, but we, you know, we bought it for 100,000 uh, you know, many years ago, and now it's worth 3 million. Well, 500,000 doesn't get you very much, does it? No. You know, take 40% times the rest of it, that's a big hit. Now, one of the things that we've been doing is that we, you will talk to your client about taking that property that's their personal residence and renting it out for a couple of years, then selling it. And because they lived in it two out of the last five years, they get to take their personal residence exemption and they can 1031 exchange the rest. Now let's say they have a lot of equity in their property. Go ahead and borrow out $500,000. Let the renter help pay for that debt. Take that $500,000 and buy a new personal residence. Then when you have the sale, wipe out that debt with a $500,000 exemption. It's a gift. So there's some neat things that you can do between 1031 and section 121, which is the exemption. And we can help you figure out how to do that if you're working with a client. But it's an area where you can be creative and talk to your client, well, we have some ideas here, we've got an expert who can help you. Bing, give us a call, we'll try to explain it, and we'll talk to their accountant to see how it all works and comes together. Another very uh, useful thing, uh, and something to uh, keep, uh, be aware of, one of the things that seems to be happening is a lot of people are, get, a lot of people are really getting older. You notice this? You know, I'm one of them, right? So, in getting older, uh, a lot of people say, oh, no, see, it's more property to manage. It's unbelievable. Uh, and I say, well, how many kids do you have living at home? <laughs> our 35 year old daughter is doing this, and our 40 year old son, and they're still here in the house. <laughs> okay, well, what are you going to do with your, you know, your property? If you, you know, uh, are you going to leave in the house? The two of them live together in the house? Or do they want to be out on their own? but they simply can't afford to buy anything in today's market. Well, there's a thing called Section 280A called equity sharing. And that equity sharing arrangement allows you to help your children get their own home. So you sell your investment property, and then you take the equity and you purchase part of the property they'd like to live in. And you make that an investment property. And then they buy the rest of it, and they get to deduct the property taxes and, they, and debt payments and whatever, under an equity sharing agreement. And the nice thing about it is, is if you've done a 1031 exchange, they rent it from you for fair market rent, maybe 90% of fair market rent. And your role, in your firm's role, is to give them an opinion, a written opinion, as to what fair market rent for that property is, so they can put it in their file in case they're ever audited. And they said, well, where did you come up with the rent number? Oh, well, we asked a professional to give us an opinion on it. Okay. So that's a neat way to help your kids get into their own home. At the same time, they're managing the property you are. They own a part. They're getting their piece of the rock. And if they ever sell it at a higher, you know, at a higher rate, they get the 121 exemption on their part. And you can 1031 exchange the rest. Clever way to involve Section 1031 into a transaction that involves personal use property. So how 
how are they going to hold the um, expectation or idea on the grant deed? So they can but, they yeah, they'll be they'll be a, an owner. Okay. They'll own a percentage of the property and oh, tenancy income. Yeah, it'll be tenants at home. Yeah, it's important to understand it, it gets straight. You don't want to be in partnerships. Partnerships have to sort of stay together. They're the taxpayer. But if you're tenants in common, you have the flexibility of trading into and out of property. Could you add your kids to the title of your house? Say, like, I have two other sons. I'll give him, uh, you know, Adam, so that we have me and my wife plus two sons, so we have a million dollar exemption. Is that possible? I'm not sure if I could quite clear on that concept. Okay, so husband and wife has $500,000 tax exception on the personal residence. Yeah. If I add my two kids into it, then there's four people, would that be 250000 times four equal million dollar exception? Yeah, I mean, technically speaking, I believe if uh, all four of you own, say, a fourth of the property, <coughs> you're each entitled to 250 exemption. So I could sell it uh, up to a million dollars, <coughs> I have tax free up to a million dollars. They would, well, each of you would have 250. You wouldn't have a million. They would have. <laughs> <laughs> they would have. And if you want to pass it to them debt, uh, you know, free of all that, uh, then you have to exercise the death option. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't, that's not part of our planning process, but you should be aware that you're going to step up in basis, you know, in the day to day. It's uh, not a bad strategy, all things considered. Any other? Yes, yes ma'am. <coughs> Then any time limitation or any times it has to be seasoned, like the two boys, how long they have to hold the title? Two years. Yes, two years, and a, uh, in a in an ownership of the property. And if they have too small a thing, they only got ten thousand gain. That's all they get. They don't get two fifty. I mean, you have to have a pretty big gain to make it work. <coughs> and their basis may be different than yours. That's another thing. That Yours goes all the way back 20 years, and theirs only goes back to last year or two years ago. So they may not have all of the gain. Well, so if in, in this case, if they distribute part of their equity to their children, is that taxable? No, distributing the equity is a gift. Guess what happens with a gift? They carry over the basis that you have in the property. So whenever you gift something with an appreciation in it, they're taking over your old cost basis. You go at all the trouble to exercise a death option, they don't get any benefit. Unless they're trying to get rid of you, in which it's a different issue. But what you want to remember is that the, the gift always, the, the cost basis travels with the gift. Whereas if you give them cash, you know, your cost basis is the same as the cash. But anytime you give out an appreciated asset, that's a, that's a problem. So it's usually better for them to inherit it and get the step up in basis and start over again with the new cost basis as at the date of death. But it's, uh, you know, these are all little planning devices, you know, that you, you can use. But what I'm saying to you here is that you do have some flexibility in terms of how you can plan transactions for 1031. Now, one of the other things that we use a lot of, and we do a lot of these, is, is a reverse exchange. And the reverse exchange is extremely useful when you're trying to get rid of the 45-day rule. Now think about this thing. If you don't have 45 days hanging over your head and you're trying to compete with other people, your negotiating position on the buy is weakened because you're willing to make concessions, anything to, you know, to you know, get something done. <coughs> and the worst part about it is, is that if you're doing that, guess what? You could be buying a property that for the next five years you wish you'd never seen. You didn't buy it because it was good, you bought it because you were trying to save taxes. With a reverse exchange, we eliminate that problem. So what, going back to always know where you're going before you leave where you've been, you find the property you wish to buy. And as a broker, this is important because it gives you two transactions instead of one, same client, right? So what we do is we buy the property for them and park it. They have 180 days from the date that we buy it and park it <coughs> to get their other one sold and have it bought from us. And the beauty of that thing is it also enhances their negotiating position on the sale. Because they've got 180 days, they don't have to take the first guy that comes around. Or let's say that they're in a situation where <clears throat> they have a transaction, they've got a non-refundable deposit up and their buyer falls out of that. 
the reverse exchange saves, saves that money. So you get the property that you want, and it works for you. No identification problem. It's a great, it's a great strategy. <coughs> and while it's a more expensive transaction, we find in about 70% of the cases, people actually make money economically because of their control over the negotiations on both sides of the transaction. So if one were to purchase the property first, and let's just say it's $2 million. One wouldn't. We would. Just well, to be clear. okay. You purchase On it. your behalf. And then there's a loan involved. Yeah. So we work with the lenders all the time to get a loan. And the loan is given to the, not you. Yeah, it is. It's given, we create an entity, corporation or an LLC. It's a special purpose entity that only owns that property. And let's say that, <clears throat> let's say you're buying something for 600000 and you're selling for five. You have a $200,000 mortgage and 300000 of equity, okay? So we borrow on a first 300000 And you're going to assume that loan because the loan is being based on your credit. But it's being made to us to park the property. Then you will assume that loan when you take it away from us. Right, I understand the mechanics, but the bank, who do they qualify? They qualify, they qualify the client. The client. Okay, that's all. And they, there's not a problem with that? Mm, hasn't been. And we, we work a lot with First Republic Bank on those okay. kinds of loans. We work with a number of lenders, and I'm sure uh, <coughs> once he figures it out, uh, he'll, <laughs> he'll say, you know, that's not a bad idea. It's a great way to get a client. And we also then wind up, in, oftentimes, if he's got a 70% loan to value ratio that he's okay with, we'll do a first and a bridge loan second. Mm -hmm. Client loans us a third. The second and third get paid off out of the proceeds from the sale. So what's neat is you control the transaction. You're in charge. And from your perspective, neat. You get a brokerage commission on the one that buy and the one on the one they sell. Two transactions, price of one client. Yeah. So if you purchase the property for your client first and then they put their house on onto the market to mm -hmm. sell it, and if it takes more than one eighty days to sell it, what would happen? Uh, your client uh, owns two properties. <laughs> <laughs> it's a math problem, you know. No, <laughs> no I mean, it, <clears throat> if the safe harbor rules uh, only allow a 180 day period. So, so you kind of need to sell it within 180 days. Yeah, but in today's market, do you think it's going to take you 180 days to sell anything? It may take you 180 days to find something to buy, that's a problem. But it, 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 interestingly enough, reverse exchanges come in very extreme markets on the sell side and very extreme markets on the buy side. When one transaction or the other doesn't move smoothly. And I haven't seen a market that where it's like balanced for a long time. I think it was right before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> what if they purchase, so maybe they, their estimate is the house will sell for two million. So they purchase something at two million first, but then it end up selling for three million. That's wonderful. I buy a second property on a regular exchange. Oh, so they can still do a Sure, you can do buy more than one property. And all we've done is park the property temporarily until they can get their deal here in the How far in advance can you buy it? Well, you can buy it. Uh, the, the, the 180 days starts the day we buy it. Oh, okay. okay. So if we always say to people, Work with your broker on the property you're selling, do all the curb appeal issues, get everything cleaned up, get it staged, get it ready to go, pocket list the property, tell your colleagues in the office that it may be coming up, but don't put it on the multiple listing service yet. Then nail down the one they want to buy, know that you've got it under control, and then pop it up on a multiple listing service and sell it. Chances are we can do a regular exchange. But if we can't, we're in the business. And we'll work with the bank and your accountant and everybody. What I suggest we do is uh, write your questions down so that uh, yeah, no problem. we can do that at the end of the, we have a, our meters are running and I've heard rumors about San Francisco. <laughs> so You've heard rumors about San Francisco? I have. <laughs> Where have you been? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> On the other He's side of the bay. Kind of the other side of the bay. But thank you, Ralph. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a minute. So, thank you. So we've, we've heard about how to swap properties, to stay in real estate, essentially. But what if you don't want to stay in real estate? What if you need to raise cash to pay down loans? Or just because you don't want to be, felt like a second class citizen, you know? <laughs> most, 
multi-property owners feel like these days. Well, in that case, we have another speaker who's going to talk about a different part of the section code, section 453, as I mentioned. And this is a way to use an installment sale, a monetized installment sale, to raise cash and have tax deferral on with it. So with that, I'm going to introduce Stan Crow. Stan Crow is the founder of Escrow Collateral Corp. When you put the escrow part, that's that's the crow part. All right. Uh, Stan, uh, since 1982, Stan is a Harvard trained uh, attorney. His law practice, uh, law practice, was admitted to practice to practice in the U.S. Tax Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals for both the Ninth and the Fourth Circuits. Uh, and also in the Idaho Supreme Court and all the lower courts. Stan has uh, and has a the company as a dealer, and we'll explain more about that later, has transacted in commercial real estate, private residences, homes, uh, businesses, partnerships, LLCs, uh, and a whole variety of other entities. Since 19, let's see, no, since 2005, Stan has been focusing on collateralized installment sales or monetized installment sales, which they do exclusively now. Um, just an anecdotal story about Stan is that last year, a federal judge approved the monetized installment sale to help a debtor in bankruptcy. And the debtor got into trouble back in 2005 or so, and had, uh, had accumulated about $2 million in debt. All that he had was a house on the beach overlooking Newport Beach, <coughs> which is worth a lot of money. But if he, pay, if he just sold that house and paid the tax, he wouldn't have been able to pay off his debtors, get out of bankruptcy, and it would, would have cleaned him out. With a monetized installment sale, he was able to pay everybody off, get out of bankruptcy, and he had cash left over to start anew. So it's an interesting way, another alternative to listen to. So with that, let's bring Stan up and listen to the monetized installment sale, 453. All right, thank you. If any of you, uh, most of you aren't, but if any of you are old enough to remember the you know, Monty Python television series, you heard John Cleese or the narrator say, and now for something completely different. <laughs> well, now for something completely different, and that's monetized installment sales. And I'm going to try to make this practical so that you'll have something to take away that you can tell someone about this alternative. And so you all have uh, paper. I know you do because we, we gave you paper. And I'm going to uh, uh, suggest that you make a drawing on that paper but at the top of the paper, so that you'll have it for later, label it monetized installment sale. And the advantage of putting a label on it is that when you go away from here and you wonder what it was that you heard about, you'll have the paper that says monetized installment sale. <laughs> and you'll be able to do this because you've done it once already when you leave here. Down the left side, put three numbers, one, two, and three. And now we're going to have nine circles to draw. But this will, this will get it done for you. And across from the number one, three circles. And label the left circle, seller. And the middle circle, the circle, dealer. And then the right circle, buyer. Now what happens is, and you could draw a line under there because three things happen that we're going to identify. And the first thing that happens is an installment sale from the seller to the dealer. My company is such a dealer. And under the Internal Revenue Code, there has been a provision since the Internal Revenue Code was first passed in 1913. 
which provides for in, uh, what's called installment reporting <coughs> at section 453. And the rule is that if you sell a capital asset and you're going to have capital gain to report, if you sell it on an installment contract, when do you pay the tax? You pay the tax when you receive the principal, pro rata, as you receive the principal. So we do a special kind of installment sale where the seller sells to my company as a dealer, and it's a no money down, interest only, 30 year installment contract. So it's 30 years, and it's interest only. So no principal is received for 30 years. So under the rule I've just told you, there's no tax for 30 years. Now there are some other things that come into play in certain circumstances, but as far as the usual rule for the capital gains tax, you're not receiving any for 30 years, so you're not paying any tax for 30 years. Then the dealer instantly, and analogous to a 1031 accommodation, the dealer instantly resells that property to whoever would have bought it directly from the seller if the dealer weren't there. So this sale is a cash sale. So there's an installment sale and simultaneously a resale that's a cash sale. And the deed that this buyer gets is the same deed from the same seller. The, the buyer does not get a deed from the dealer. The deed is, a, deed is a directed deed which goes around the dealer from the seller to the buyer. So the buyer gets the same deed on the same day from the same person with the same representations and warranties as if there were no dealer involved. So title only passes once, but there are two sales, an, uh, an installment sale and a cash sale. That's the first thing that happens. Because it's an installment sale with no money down and no principal paid for 30 years, there's no capital gains tax in the usual case for 30 years. Now the second thing that happens is in relation to this word monetized, and I will tell you we did not invent the phrase monetized installment sale. The IRS invented the phrase. In 2012, the IRS chief counsel issued a memorandum dealing with in quotes, an installment sale coupled with a monetization loan. So they invented the phrase, so we use the phrase. Monetized installment sale, or an installment sale coupled with a monetization loan. And now we get to the monetization. Here we had the installment sale. Now we draw three circles again. And label the first one, lender. And the middle one, seller. And the right one, anything. Now what happens here is in the monetization is the lender at the closing lends money to the seller. And it's no coincidence that just as the installment sale was 30 years interest only, the loan is 30 years interest only. Entire lump sum due at the end. That's the monetization loan. The reason it's called a monetization loan is the seller is getting an installment contract with no cash. Simultaneously, the seller is getting a loan with cash. And this is a different party, a completely independent lender, unrelated to the seller, unrelated to the dealer, unrelated to the buyer. So the seller goes away from the closing with non-taxable loan proceeds, equal, nearly, nearly equal in amount to what this buyer paid. And when I say nearly equal, the benchmark is typically 95%. That, that can vary, but it's typically 95%. Now, when the seller receives that cash, 
The seller can do what with it? <coughs> Anything. The seller can buy other property. The seller can invest in financial instruments. The seller can invest in his business. Um, anything. There is no restriction on the scope of what can be done. There are implications about what the choice is, but there's no legal restriction on what can be done with the money. The money, uh, the lender requires that the seller affirm that the seller will use the money for a business or investment purpose that lasts at least a day is essentially what it amounts, amounts to. And the only reason for that is the lender doesn't care what the seller uses the money for. But the lender doesn't want to be making a consumer finance loan, so the seller affirms this is a business loan or this is an investment loan, but the lender doesn't care what the seller does with it. So the seller can invest that money in anything, and the seller is receiving interest from the dealer on the installment contract and paying interest on the loan simultaneously. And those amounts will match each other. And so that's the monetization loan. Uh, that's what happens at the time of the closing. Now there's one more thing that happens. And what the one more thing that happens is, how does it work that the funding happens how is the seller assured that the dealer is really going to pay? Because if we pay as we promise, the amount that we will pay will exactly equal what the, what the seller owes to the lender. And so, because the seller doesn't want it to reach into this money to repay the loan, the seller wants to be sure the dealer is really going to pay. So how does the seller know that the dealer really will pay? Again. How many circles? Three circles. And now label the left one dealer. And the middle one is going to be a little more complex. To illustrate the middle circle, you need to draw three lines, or pardon me, two lines. So it's made in, make, make the middle circle into three sections. And what this is, these are escrows. And this, these are set up with a long-term escrow company to process the payments, process all the cash flows. In the left section of that circle, label it I, put a letter I. And what that stands for is installment escrow. There are three <coughs> escrows to make this work. And there's an installment contract with money flowing, so there's an installment escrow. Label the middle one with an F, as in Frank. And what that stands for is the funding escrow. And I'll explain that one in a moment. And then label the right one with an L for the loan escrow. So there are three escrows and they will last for 30 years. Well, what happens then is that the escrow company is authorized to reach into the dealer's funds and take money that belongs into the installment escrow. And so let's say the monthly interest payment is $5,000. The escrow company reaches into the dealer's funds, takes $5,000, and put it in, puts it into the installment escrow. And so that escrow pertains to this, and the dealer is credited with having made the installment interest payment. So the dealer's fulfilled that month's obligation. As soon as it reaches the installment escrow, it transfers to the middle one, the funding escrow. And the dealer has no connection with that. It's just the seller's money. And when it transfers to the funding escrow, it then does one more transfer to the loan escrow. And so we put in the right-hand circle down here, lender. And as soon as it gets to the loan escrow, the seller is credited with having made the loan interest payment. So the seller hasn't made a deposit. The seller hasn't written a check. The seller hasn't done anything electronic. 
All of this is done through the escrow company, which has three escrow accounts, like bank accounts, and the money transfers through them and ends up in the lender's hand and pays the lender. But there's one more thing to make it work, and that's a guarantee. And let's see, where should we put that guarantee? Let's put this a G above lender. Now the loan, the loan guarantee that you would expect would be a guarantee that would tell the lender you're going to get paid. This is not that kind of guarantee. This is a guarantee to the seller that the seller won't have to pay the lender out of any money other than what comes into this installment escrow from the dealer. So it's a limited recourse loan from the, from the lender to the seller. And the lender says to the seller, I cannot compel you to pay more on this loan than you receive from the dealer. So if the dealer does not pay you, I cannot come after you to make up the difference. So the loan is guaranteed to the borrower. But the borrower won't have to come up with any money other than what comes from the dealer. So it's a single source, single recourse loan. So the seller doesn't qualify in any other way. The seller qualifies simply by entering into this installment contract. And once the seller does that, the seller gets typically a 95% loan up front to do with as the seller pleases. And then the repayment of the loan is through this process. And all the seller has to do is watch it happen. And every year, the seller will get an accounting from the escrow company and will show the payments received payments paid and those will match and get the 1099s for the tax numbers and the seller's <coughs> tax return. And that is a monetized <coughs> installment sale. This is the installment sale. This is the monetization. This is the process to assure that the seller really will get paid <coughs> or if the seller doesn't get paid, the seller won't care because the seller can leave, keep the loan proceeds anyway. Now, what, I'll take your question. What is the security for the lender? There is no security. <coughs> this installment contract is unsecured. And if we default, if my company defaults, we can be sued, but it's unsecured. The loan is unsecured. But you did ask the right question. And Why I'll try, to be, okay. I'll try to be really quick about this, but it involves very broad financial concepts. Um, the key to this is, and that I guess I should say then in answering the question, the question was, how's the lender protected? Well, you, want, you ought to know, that's what drives this. What drives this is the lender. This is not tax benefits that drive this. The lender has come up with a way to achieve a higher risk-adjusted return than is possible otherwise. And here's why. This 30-year installment contract means that none of the principal will be paid for 30 years, not one dollar. <coughs> that means that when the buyer pays this cash and the dealer has the cash from the buyer, it can be invested for 30 years. <coughs> Over the past century, the stock market has returned 9 and 10 percent returns for every 30-year period. You can pick a date and go back June 1, 1945. Pick a date and go forward 30 years and you'll find that the stock market <coughs> has produced 9 and 10 percent returns. That's not true for 10 years. It's not true for 7 years or 5 years or 2 years. It's true for 30 years. The lender and the dealer have an agreement that the dealer will invest the resale proceeds in accord with the lender's investment criteria. So the lender sets the criteria. Chief being, that principal won't be called on for 30 years. So unlike a commercial mortgage that's typically paid off in five or seven or 10 years, the, the lender knows this money is going to be invested with a 30-year horizon. And there should be multiples of the amount of money needed at the end to pay the seller in full. Lender has a way. So the benchmark interest rate here is 
to the lender. The lender believes this is a way the lender can get 30 years at 6% and have it just run. And they, they're also a ma there's a matching of asset and liability. Lenders get into difficulty with short-term deposits and long-term loans. These are matched, so it deals with that. It deals with re reinvestment risk because it's a pooled situation, essentially, because these deals are coming online at all times and maturing at all times. And so the lender's reinvestment risk, the lender not being able to reinvest the money whenever the seller happens to pay the loan off, um, they don't have that problem either. So their risk-adjusted return, they believe, is higher than with commercial mortgage lending that they had traditionally done. So that's what drives it. And because they want that, their clients get tax deferred. Have they been around for a long time, the lenders doing this? And who are they? Well, they've been doing this now since uh, they're in their fourth year of doing this. Okay. But they've been a commercial mortgage lender for 20 years or something. Okay. But this is but it's mortgage lending. Just you wonder, you might think it's a bank. It's not a bank. Uh, under Dodd-Frank, banks can't do 30 years unsecured lending. It has to be privately raised. <coughs> so I think my time is probably up and let you ask questions. There you go. How about that one? <laughs> Okay, so now we have time for questions and answers for both uh, Ralph and Stan. And uh, we've we sort of reached out to the association uh, in advance just for some general questions to see that some people couldn't, uh, couldn't come today. So, but uh, we can first take uh, questions for the audience, but perhaps I can start with a couple that we have fielded just to kind of get your brain cells thinking about this a little bit. So uh, <coughs> the first question that we we talked was about this concept here. And, uh, and, they, and the question is, all right, so what you're really saying here is that the seller gets cash, doesn't have to write monthly checks to make loan payments, and, uh, and then the loan that they're taking out is for all practical purposes a non-recourse. It's limited liability, but it's non-recourse, practically speaking. Is, is that correct? That's close. Did you want to add anything else, Dan? Uh, <laughs> I want to hear your question. Well, so, so, so the question is, the question that came up was, what happens if you want to end this process? Say someone dies or something happens. How do you want to end this loan? You've got a 30-year cycle going on with this escrow, what happens if you want to, you know, cut it uh, earlier than that, for five years, or ten years, or? The only reason that I can think of why anyone would want to close it early would be if the person has a substantial capital loss. Now, let's say in year seven, the seller has a substantial capital loss and would like to be able to take the deferred gain and balance it against that loss. There's nothing allowing the seller automatically to do that. We did uh, negotiate that actually in one instance in which the seller could require that we prepay so that they could take advantage. But generally, we do not. And it would take the lender's consent because the lender wants this money placed for 30 years. But the seller can always ask for the installment contract to be prepaid and for the loan at the same time to be prepaid either in whole or in part so they can take advantage of a loss. Otherwise, I can't think of any reason why they would want to do so. Is the, is the loan written with a prepayment penalty in it for the life of the loan? It actually it does not have a prepayment penalty. Uh, in the installment contract, we cannot prepay. In the loan, if the seller wishes to come up with other money to prepay the loan, the seller can. The lender believes that's a very unlikely circumstance seller will want to come up with other funds to repay that loan. Given, if maybe I don't know, didn't the seller just get all the cash? Uh, I yeah, like how you put that because didn't the seller just get all <laughs> the cash? Well, the seller got the loan proceeds in cash. That's what I mean. Right. Okay. My company keeps the sale right. proceeds. 
what, okay, there, you said that they were about 95% of the right. amount. Okay, so almost all the cash. Why would anyone want to prepay other than, I mean, wouldn't they want to use that loss against maybe something else if they had some accumulated right. loss? And, right. and, and I, I want to go back to the cash. Um, <laughs> I sometimes say this as a joke to sellers, and sometimes they get it, and sometimes I think it puts them off. <laughs> because I will say, go through just the first line, nothing nothing below that yet, just the first line across there, and I will say, look, we're going to give you a contract that promises we'll pay you interest monthly and principal in 30 years, and we're going to keep all the cash from the resale. Isn't this great? <laughs> <laughs> they don't think that sounds so great. <laughs> uh, doesn't get great for them until they see right. the monetization loan. Remember, um, remember one there, if the buyer finds a problem with the property, if the buyer will screw the seller, but not the dealer, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I missed that. Oh, yep. yeah. Number one there, so yes. the buyer got the property, but if the buyer finds some problem with the property, so they will screw the seller, but not the dealer, right? Correct. If, uh, yes, if, if the, we do not find the buyer, we do not bring them together, the seller and the buyer come together on their own, and the seller most usually, sometimes the buyer brings us in, but the seller then brings us in to be an intermediate party. I see. And the property is sold to us, but we don't go into title. So the seller provides the school shoes to the buyer directly. Yeah. Yeah, essentially, it works somewhat similarly. This direct feeding concept works the same way <coughs> in 1030 in exchange. Right. Now, because That's it's right. qualified intermediary, it's working like this, only we're not a dealer. Well, actually, technically, we probably are. But uh, uh, the reality is, is that the original contract and stuff is still between the buyer and the seller. So whatever obligations they have to one another, you know, still uh, right. exist. That's right. Now that may create the loss situation that you were talking about. <laughs> that um, might be helpful to get part of that thing paid now. <coughs> and the other thing you need to remember too is that there's no step up in basis on date of death. With with you know with an installment sale because installment it's sale. a yes. it's a transaction during the lifetime of the seller. Whereas with an exchange, there's a step up in basis. Oh, so and that, that's an interesting comparison because with an exchange, there is a step up in basis because you still own property. With the installment contract, you don't own the property, so there's not a step up in basis. The difference then is that with the, with the installment sale, you will receive the principal in 30 years and pay the tax in 30 years. What's happened over 30 years? Inflation. And if, if we have a 3% inflation rate over 30 years, and the Federal Reserve's goal is 2%, if we have a 3% inflation rate over 30 years, the dollar will be worth 40 cents as compared with today. So when you pay the tax, you'll be paying the tax for the dollars worth 40 cents. That's a 60% reduction in the tax. That more than makes up for a step up in basis in most circumstances. So that's how this approach is that. Okay, last question. So that assumes that all the rules are the same in 30 years as they are now. What if they get rid of capital gains and there's ordinary income? Wonderful. If they get rid of capital gains and, well, it, no, and we pay, yeah. Uh, it, it would depend on how they do it because they could repeal the capital gains tax as some are proposing. And if they repeal it outright, then there'd be no tax. They might only make it effective, though, as to new transactions. There's just no predictable. So I guess the, <coughs> the motto is delay, 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 right? Yeah, for the record, the government does the same thing. Why? Because they're borrowing money and hoping that a deal paid off in cheaper dollars. They're, they're, uh, it just works strangely enough the same way. If it's a deflationary scenario, then it's a different story because then the value of your dollar is going up relative to uh, you know, the debt. It doesn't pay to be a debtor in a deflationary scenario. It pays to be a debtor in an inflationary scenario. Um, well, I just want to understand this right. The benefit for the seller is to save around 60% tax because they don't pay tax now. They pay tax after 30 years when this astral, astral cycle ends. And also, uh, for now, they pay like kind of a Five percent fee because they only get ninety-five percent of the tax, so that's all the cost. 
thank you for that. And I would say just first that it's not a fee because we don't charge a fee because it would be silly to charge a fee for the privilege of keeping all the money. <laughs> so we get 100% of the money. If you want to think of our fee as 100%, it's 100%. But the cost to the seller to wait the way, I would say to think, to get a, a good handle on what the um, tax deferral is, what the benefit of paying the tax in 30 years is, is as compared to today, would be to go out, say to a life insurance company, and price a single premium annuity, and estimate what the tax is going to be in 30 years, and say, I want that to mature in 30 years, how much will you charge me today to buy that annuity? And you'll get a, you'll get a number. And if the tax is going to be a million and they charge you um, 85000 for getting an annuity that will mature in 30 years and pay you a million, then you know that it's essentially costing you 85000 and you can take all the rest of the money instead of paying a million now and put that money to work. So that's a way to measure that. You could buy a life insurance policy that would cover yeah. yourself. That's, that's, right. Right. that's right. In case that, that it helps deal with the death options thing. <laughs> To make it simple, if I sell property for a hundred dollars, I get ninety five dollars in my bank account and pay tax on ninety five dollars after oh. thirty years. You you would pay tax. Um, well, uh, one thing is that the lender charges a fee, and then there are closing costs. So uh, the seller actually nets if the loan is ninety five percent, the seller nets about ninety three and a half percent. So about six and a half percent gone because the lender, the net funds are about 93.5%. So what you want the 93.5% to do is to make enough money over 30 years to make up the 6.5% and a whole lot more. And one would ordinarily expect mm -hmm. that 93.5% uh, compounded at a very modest rate will be 400%. When you do this type of transaction, do, do all the funds have to go into that, or can I say, Jay, I got that 500,000 capital gains, I can pull that and do what I want with that, and just the part that, portion of it be put into that, or do you have, does the, all the funds have to go into it? No, that's not all. And it can be fractional interest, it can be uh, one owner and not all owners. Um, an owner might decide who's got a $20 million sale, I want to do this on 10 million, but not do it on 10. All of that's possible okay. because the installment contract can be for any percentage interest. And that thing to remember is like on a personal residence, I, I was showing you the 1031 aspect, but you could sell your personal residence, take out the 500000 and take the rest of it. So it's as if. Or let's say that you're working on a 1031 exchange, you missed your 45-day rule, now you're facing the tax, we can then transfer uh, the balance over to stands uh, group and you can convert your exchange into an installment set. So all it, what you think about it is it's a fallback position for what you'd originally intended. That's your primary purpose, but it may be your original purpose. Uh, structured sales, I mean, it's just, just like if you get a lawsuit and you get paid out over a period of years, but you need the cash now, you find some similar kind of arrangement to take the cash now and then uh, sell the installment uh, things to a structured sales player. So, you know, it's, it's, an, it's just an interesting additional dimension to all the things you can normally do on a real estate transaction. It just allows for uh, some additional creative work that you can do when you're trying to solve a problem for a client. Can this yeah. be done for like a vacation home? Or any, any, kind a of, any kind of thing that you any sell, any asset that you sell, it's not the type of asset you sell. It has, has to do with the 1031 aspect. So with what Stan's doing, it could be any asset. Okay. It can be stock in a private company, it can be uh, the business you own, it can be an LLC interest, it can be a doctor's practice, it can be an art collection. The only thing it can't be, it can't be your ex-husband. That's not <laughs> <laughs> What's the interest rate? Did I? Must have gone interest rate. Well, the interest rate on the on a loan is typically six percent and on the on the installment contract is set to cover that. Where does the seller make money in this? The seller makes money with this. He 
because the seller has loan proceeds the seller can invest and put to work. Yeah, but if both interest rates are 6%, I'm missing something. Because we're paying the seller 6%. Okay. The seller is using the same money to pay the lender 6%, plus the seller has this money. Invest. The seller has the loan proceeds to invest, and there's no financing cost that the seller has to, no net cost to the seller for that loan. I mean, the, 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 client, the client could even turn around and, and buy a piece of real estate That's right. uh, without it being an exchange, and then they would have a step up in basis for right. depreciation purposes going right. forward. I mean, that's another yeah. way you could look at it. So right. what you want to be sure you know, to do is to find something that's a worthwhile investment. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, did I hear you right that this has only been four years that this has been done? Right. And the odd thing is, the provision for this in the tax code went in in 1980. Yeah, well, that's what I heard. So, but that makes me nervous. So, I mean, it seems too good to the, be true to me. Because so. the, the reason it's not being widely done uh -huh. is that the relationship with the lender to do this is a hard thing to put together. And I know of only one other instance that it, in which it's been done, and that was the one the IRS chief counsel wrote a memorandum about. But it was just all constructed for a one-time thing. We're doing it as business. Well, you should also mention, Stan, that you've been doing these installment sale things in a little different model for yeah. a number of years. It's not just four years. Right. Yeah, this we, particular strategy is four years old. Yeah, we've been doing installment sales for 10 years. Yes? I have a question. Um, if you inherit a property that's already been completely depreciated. I know a couple of people are in this situation and they keep telling me, you know, they can't sell the property, you know, for, for tax reasons or whatever. Couldn't you do something like that and, and get around all that issue? Uh, well, if, if they've inherited property, they would have gotten a step up in basis at some point. Yeah. But it might have been 30 years ago when they inherited yeah. it and there's been lots of gains since. Yeah. And yes, you could do this for that. Okay, because uh, they always tell me they can't do it, but this would be a way that they could do it. Correct. <coughs> yes. Yeah, just as a, as a disclosure question, um, if we have a seller who's going to sell a property on the 1031 exchange, we disclose that saying, and the wording would go in the contract. Would it be the similar kind of wording? What wording would we put in to say, subject to the 453? Just the same, just put that wording in? Well, there are lots of ways in which Ralph does and, and what we do can blend together. And for example, the fractional interest question, you could do a tax deferred exchange on, a, on 50% and an installment sale on 50% because you might want to have cash in this way. That, um, that quite wasn't quite his question. I, I think what he's trying to get at is we're used to a certain nomenclature to advise the buyer of the real property right. that they need to cooperate and that they've agreed to cooperate oh, I see. with the facilitator. Yes. So right. instead of saying buyer to cooperate with a 1031 exchange, right. I think it may be as simple as say buyer to cooperate with and then describe it. There's a paragraph much like you would use uh, in a, an exchange in an agreement with a buyer to cooperate, to cooperate with this. And remember, if we set it up as an exchange in the first place, that's the end of it anyway with the uh, buyer. Right. Okay. And then what we do is we would sell you know, the proceeds and stuff to, to him because you couldn't find a property that you wanted to buy and your exchange failed. This is really an sort of an insurance policy against the failure of your exchange. Thank you. Yes. So um, just to make sure I understand, so I would think that a typical seller uh, would be, I don't know, let's just say in the 50s. So we add 30 years to that, there's a decent chance they're dead before the 30 years. <laughs> so just so that I understand the way it works, um, when that seller does die, um, at that point, the government is taking their capital gain. Yes? No. No, well, not at the death, at the end of the 30 years. Okay, so from what source does the government get their capital gains at the end of the 30 years if the seller died in year two? I think the government wonders that as well. Uh, <laughs> but, but legally, Whoever inherits the estate, yeah. inherits the installment contract, inherits the liability on the loan, and inherits the tax obligation. Okay. And then the next person and the next person if there's a succession of deaths. Yeah. Um, does this not make sense for an older person because the, it's all about the time value of money? Or because of what you just explained to me, it, it makes just as much sense because it's going to be passed on to the estate 
and not collect it for 30 years. Well, I would say, uh, and, and I'd be interested in Ralph's answer on this as well, but a lot of it comes down to exp life expectancy. And if, if a person, I, I would think if a person is quite confident that his or her life is going to end within two or three or four or five years even, then if the property is eligible for a 1031 exchange, do that. Because this is, this is a longer term horizon. But you'd be surprised how many 70-year-olds, and I can say that, uh, how many 70-year-olds expect to be around 30 years. And so, you'll find this out like at answer. some point in time in the future. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I ask a question for 1031 attorney? Yeah. So I have two clients in this exact situation. Um, they have sold their homes that have substantial gain more than $500,000. Are selling or have, have sold? Have sold, I'm sorry, pardon me. They have homes with substantial gain, which they have abandoned to renters, both of them in the last year because of transfers of jobs. And I have reminded them that if they're going to take advantage of the $500,000, they will need to sell within three years of, of that. And of course, I have incentive, I want them to sell. And they're thinking about, okay, rents are so good, and if rents remain this good for over many, 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 many years, maybe letting the $500,000 go is a way. But I think what you're telling me is that they can do both. And the way that I can encourage them to do both is to tell them, you can sell, you can take your $500,000 gain, and you can then not pay capital gains on the rest by then doing a 1031 exchange with the remaining funds. Yeah, right? it's not capital gains on the rent, but that's ordinary income. But uh, yeah, I mean, what you're saying is, is it smart to go for the next 10 years and convert it fully to a 1031, then you lose your exemption. Right. So if you want to get rid of, you want to take the gift, yeah. sell it, you know, yeah, right after two years. Then you can 1031 exchange the rest and start collecting the rent on that, but you'd also have cash, which you could also invest in the rental property and buy another one. So it's really, it's a, it's a transaction whereby getting rid of it, you get the benefit of the gift. And, I mean, there aren't many gifts left from the government, but that's, this one's a good one. You want to just to make it. sure, so let's just pretend they both have a million dollar gain, right? We sell it within this time period where they're able to take advantage of the $500,000 yeah. free gain. They then will buy some replacement property, which they will identify within 45 days and blah, right. blah, blah. Um, with, the, with the remaining $500,000 or more. Yeah. Okay, great. And that gain, that $500,000 gain on the investment side is carried forward and deferred within the context of the property they buy. Okay, so at the time that they sell, assuming that they do find replacement property and do buy um, that replacement property within the specified period of time, there will be no tax consequences at that point. Yeah, as long as they continue to hold the property. <coughs> the new I mean, property. Yeah, the new property. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, uh, I mean, he said his, his thing's been around since 1913, and 1031's been around since 1921, so it's a pretty well-established piece of law. But it's become a lot more simple to operate since the 84 Tax Reform Act came in and created the 45-180A rule and set up the process and procedures. In 1991, they came up with regulations that simplified it even more, and in 2000, they created the reverse exchange. So 1031 exchanges have become a lot easier and more efficient to do as time has gone on. What we don't know is if for whatever reason the tax code changes, and there's a lot of discussion about this. The only thing I can tell you about the tax code is that Congress benefits from complexity. You don't, Congress does. Because the tax code is the largest creator of special interests who contribute to their campaigns to allow them to remain in power. That's why the Internal Revenue Code does not get simpler, it gets more complex. You guys, there's about five more minutes left in the scheduled presentation. Yes. The crew at SFAR said we can have more time if you guys want to stick around. But I just want to make sure that everyone's aware it's about 4.25. We can be in here until about 4.30. Yeah. I just want to understand 1031 exchange an example. So if a client purchased a house for $1 million, spent $1 million to remodel it, and so is it so now that uh, one million to remodel it, now they have a cost basis of two million. Yeah, so their net profit is one million. Uh, if they sell it for free. Uh, yes. 
So when they exchange it, they only need to buy something one million. No, they need to buy that. something for three. Equal or up the net sales price. Gross less your commission and sales costs. Net sales price. If they net. buy something for two million, then what? Well, they could either sale. take a million of it and send it over to Stan, or they could buy a second property. You have to get equal or up the net sales price. In other words, $3 million sales price, less commissions and things, you have to get that is to be the purchase price of what you buy or a combination of things that you do buy. So you can buy more than one property to get up to that number. And let me tell you that the IRS takes the gain off the top. I do get this question, well, can I take out my original cost basis? Yeah. IRS has a great laugh over that and says, no, 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 we take ours first. And guess which one they take out first? Depreciation recapture at 25%. After that's all used up, then they take out the capital gain. So, and sometimes if you have a client who has capital losses of some kind, or lost carry forwards, or unused passive losses, uh, those can be offset against any gain they recognize. And we call any partial gain on an exchange, we call it boot. It comes to the old pirate term of booty. That boot is just that amount of gain that you recognize on your transaction. And as I say, it, depending on your adjusted gross income, you could be up in the 38 to 48, 40% range. Because the maximum in California is actually 13, uh, I think 13 and third percent. So the higher up you go, the more difficult it gets. If you do installment sales, you could decide before the sale or at the day you sign the contract? You, you, can do, you can do an installment sale thing in Stan's plan because that's what you want to do up front. Or you can set it up as an exchange and pass it to that if you can't succeed in your exchange. Uh, so if you happen to have 45 days and you can't... And you can't find something, then this is your fallback change. position. Think of this, I always look at it as, from my perspective as a fallback position. So that's where it's useful. Now one, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll pass on to you as well. If any of you, uh, we only did a quick summary at 1031 here. But if any of you want me to come over to your offices or your agents and stuff, please feel free to call. I, I do a lot of lectures at real estate brokers offices to try to train them in how these things work. So it's an open invitation. All you have to do is call me. And we can, or you have your broker call me, whatever. It's not a problem. I'm happy to do it. It's uh, fun for me. I enjoy doing it, so it's not a problem. Is basically debt the only way around the boot? Well, not. It, it's well, you, <coughs> you can't sell and then die. Well, you can, but it won't help you with the boot. <laughs> <laughs> Poor planning on your part. If that's what you're doing. You, you, if you're, if, but if you're about to close and you die first, then you get to step up and you don't have to worry. It, it, it's just a peculiar thing, uh, and, and this may change too. It all ties into the estate tax. This may be a question that uh, I should ask my CPA, but assuming that somebody does the installment sale and they've got 10 years to go, all the money goes to their trust when they die, and I assume the obligation goes to their trust as well. Also, this asset that's over here. Well, yes, everything goes to the trust. But let's say the trust then is disbanded because the money's given out to all the different people, and yet there's that obligation. How, how does that work? Well, does that have to be discharged before the trust can be closed? The, the, there's flexibility, and you can plan accordingly. You, the seller is whoever owns whatever it, whatever it is that's being sold. The loan doesn't necessarily have to be to the same person or entity as the seller. It can actually be a different entity. And so it's possible to put one one place and one another as long as those escrows are set up that way. But um, uh, it's possible also to create in an installment contract a provision for successors. Um, you can do probate provisions in an installment contract so that it provides right in it that in the event of the death of a parent seller, then uh, the child takes parent's place. So it does lots of flexibility, and the reason is because it's a contract, so you can create it as you wish. And I want to say to you, to all of you, that what I've given you here equips you to tell what it is to someone, 
uh, it won't equip you to answer tax questions, and it won't equip you to know all the whys, and it won't equip you to know variations on this. But, but this is a structure now you can describe the basic structure to someone, and that's all that I hope to be able to get to you today. Yeah, one thing, if, you, if your parent uh, uh, passes on and has one of these things, and you have a black sheep brother, you can leave <laughs> him that deal because you know how it works and he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, well, we're at 4.30. I would, I have one last question. <clears throat> what, uh, what happens if Escrow Collateral Corporation exercises their death option and they're no longer around in 30 years? What happens? And the seller would not be concerned. In fact, the seller would be happy <laughs> if we're not around. Because remember, I said the rule is that the seller owes the tax when the seller receives the principal. So the seller's going to hope we go away and don't pay, because then the seller doesn't defer the tax, the seller avoids the tax. But the lender would care a great deal if escrow collateral court goes away. And they've had discussions with me about our succession plan. Mm -hmm. So that's where the concern is, and that's the one that we have to satisfy with regard to succession. I mean, theoretically, you have a forgiveness of debt issue. Mm -hmm. Well, the lender actually, there's an anti-forgiveness provision in the loan. Um, in the loan, there is a provision which prohibits the lender from writing down the loan, so the lender cannot send a 1099-C for cancellation of debt income. So if the loan is not paid, it is not forgiven. And this is something the seller needs to realize, that if escrow collateral corp doesn't pay, the seller is not escaping the debt. The seller can't be forced to pay it, but it's on the balance sheet. And so there won't, be, there won't be any forgiveness of debt income. There's also a provision in the loan agreement that prohibits the lender from reporting non-payment to a credit reporting agency. So our failure to pay won't hurt the seller's credit. But the lender is the one that's taking those risks. All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for coming to the workshop today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.